Welcome back to the show, The Unbroken with Sam Davis. Sam, I am right here. Out there in the real world, I'm an interventionist with over 14 years of experience. But in here, I like to interview cool people doing some cool stuff and people that I think that you need to know about. My guest today I've known for years. And I believe that there are some people that were created to be healers. In order for those people to be healers, they had to go through a, an array of trials and tribulations. And my guy that I'm going to interview here today is a true healer. I've trusted him with family members of mine. And I'm honored to have him here today, and his name is Jason Chain. What's going on, Jason? How you doing, buddy? Hey, Sam. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming all the way from Hawaii mm -hmm. via Texas yep. and headed to Florida. You're all over the place. So, man, I see you and everyone that I, when I mention your name to people that don't know you or have not been introduced to you, I say he is one of the most level people I've ever met that I expect you to, like, levitate at any moment. I mean, you are, you are there. And it wasn't always that way. What was it like being Jason Chain when you were little? What did Jason Chain little Jason Chain want to be when Jason grew up? Young Jason wanted to be somewhere else other than where he was. That's always what it was. When I went out, I wanted to be an astronaut. And the main reason I wanted to be an astronaut because I wanted to get the hell out of here. <laughs> I, uh, I used to look up at the, I'd go out of my grandma's house and I distinctly always remember this. I would, it was, there's no light pollution. I grew up in a small town in Texas. My grandma's house, uh, it's out in the middle uh, you know, kind of nowhere, and there's no light, and you can see the stars. Like, I used to always look at those and say, that's where I want to be. That's my home. Somewhere out there, like, I, I shouldn't have been where I was. You know, my family, my heart would just hurt so much for what I was seeing going on in front of me, but I couldn't change it. Well, what was going You want to go into some of what was going on? I mean, what was it like? What were you seeing? What was... My dad was fresh back from Vietnam, and my mom was in high school. They dated. My mom got pregnant with me in high school. They loved each other. They still they're still married to this day. They've been married fifty years. I know how long they've been married because it's always a few months older than me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they just celebrated fifty years. But you know, to say it was blissful, you know, my parents will probably see this. To say it was blissful, I think they'd both. <laughs> Agree that there's been ups and downs in there, right. but that they know more about PTSD and everything now than they did then. But my dad coming back, I mean, my dad was in in war and he was in real war. He was in Vietnam and he was a Marine and he was in it. He, he was he was he was in it. He, he was, was in it. combat. Yeah, and day after day after day. My dad combat. weighed 127 pounds when he came back from Vietnam. He went in there weighing about 190. He got malaria. My dad's got shrapnel in his back. He's got scars. My dad. Dropped out of high school in the ninth grade. Um, not to say he's not smart, because he is, but you know, he wrote this, he wrote it about his time there. And within the first 24, 48 hours he was there, he was already in a in a fight and lost. I think there was 22 men. If I remember right, I think 22 men went out on a I can't remember what he called it. He went out with a Mac Marine, which is a guy that's been there a long time. Recruited him right when he got there. And I think eight of them survived it right off the bat. So my dad was 18 years old. When I, he actually read me a letter that a, that a friend of his, he had written a letter to a friend of his when he was over there, and the friend sent it back to him years later. And I got to read a letter that my dad wrote when he was in Vietnam to a friend of his. And when he read it to me, it was like a child. I mean, really, when I think about how young my dad really was fighting for his life, and doing things over there that would haunt him the rest of his life, I um, I developed a really, you know, I already had a lot of compassion for him, but I, I just don't think people realize, I don't think it's, I think it's impossible to realize. I think really for me to even pretend that I even realize, even though I've heard his memoir and I've lived his life since, lived with him, um, would be grossly underestimating what it is for a soul to go through something like that. To have to do what you have to do. And have no choice in it. No. Like, he was drafted or did he enlist? No, he enlisted because he knew he would be drafted. Being a high school dropout, me and my dad knew that it was coming for him. And so he joined the Marines because he thought that would give him the best 
chance to survive. Right. He looked at the Marines as most people do as a as a as an elite force, and um, not that the Army wouldn't be, but he just that's what he chose to do because he knew his day was coming. I think you know what really crushed my dad the most was that the whole time he was there, the perception that he had of how he would be viewed when he got back was one of like, hey, it'd be worth it because you'll be a hero or at least people will respect you. And when he got back, people were throwing shit at him. and He's already it traumatized. Broke his heart. Yeah, yeah, he's already in trauma. Whatever he had, it was broken when he got back. Yeah. You know, the girl that he dated was dating somebody else. You know, it's the classic. You know, you could write a movie. You could make a movie out of it. But that memoir he wrote, I swear I've seen Full Metal Jacket. I've seen Platoon. I've seen Apocalypse Now. I've seen a lot of movies <clears throat> about Vietnam. And there's nothing that I saw that even comes close to what he wrote about. I wanted to 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 say, I wanted to take that and make a book out of it because it was so powerful. But I think for my dad it was just therapeutic. And I, I don't know if he burned it or lost he said he lost it. But I think for him, he just needed to get it out of him. Pen to paper, mm -hmm. just like we do yeah. in recovery, pen to paper. Yep. And he got it out of him, and he read it to me, which is like a fifth step. Mm -hmm. I, think I'm a, I think I'm the only person that he read that to. You know, I think I was honored with that. But growing up with him in that state, I mean, my, I would call my dad zero, zero to table flip in .5 seconds. Right. You know, he could be with you, and everything could be cool, and then... His eyes, if you locked eyes with my dad, it was like looking at a pit bull. You didn't look you didn't lock eyes with my dad. You just looked at the ground and said, Yes, sir, yes, sir. Because if you did, it was a challenge that you didn't want you didn't want. Today, I mean loud noises, dropping plates, breaking something would just set him off. You grow up in a in a state of fear and hypervigilance in that state. You know, a lot of people have fathers who are alcoholics and when they're drunk, they 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 know the 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 feel of the room when their dad's not right, right. When mom's not right. With me, it was always kind of constant because my dad could just flip at any moment. And it wasn't due to alcohol. No, it was he just wasn't due drinking. To, my, dad, just my dad still to this day. He I was just with him two days ago, and he drank at a wedding, maybe a little bit. But I mean, my dad drinks like twice a year. Uh, it's not his thing. As to being a, a true addict in the in the sense that I am, I don't see that with him. But I do see a, a person whose soul went through the ringer. I believe, you know, what 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 we learn about trauma and what we learn, like a, that stuff was downloaded into me. Part of my DNA went to Vietnam. Part of my DNA saw the pain and atrocity and the violence that went on there. And I've never really been attracted to violence. I've always had a, 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 a distinct respect for violence. And fear, honestly. Like I played football, I played all sports, and I had to hit and I got hit and I hit people. Most of the time I was scared. And um I think some people don't have that, but I do. And I believe it's survival. But when fights have broken out around me, there's a certain energy that changes the room. And I uh and I've for me it's life or death. I don't see it as like we're going to get up and shake hands as friends later. I see it as like somebody's going to die here. That's always the way I viewed it. And I think a lot of that has to do with the trauma my dad endured and then was born into me through DNA sequencing, you know, through that. This stuff, you got to think humans are really, they talk about like open source artificial intelligence. Humans are really open source intelligence. We're not artificial. But everything that every human has ever learned over the history of time, plants to eat, not to eat, a dog to mess with and not to mess with, that's all within us, within each and every one of us. That is downloaded through, through the trauma that we've endured. We understand things that happened to our ancestors thousands of years ago. It's inside of us. We just don't hear it. That intuition, it's there. It's just such a small voice that you don't always hear it. If I can just get quiet enough, I have access to all the experience of every human life that's ever lived. I believe that. Not just my dad's. That's just close to me. But that really, all that intelligence is there. It's open source, too. Everything that humans encounter, we learn from. And just I believe like, it's passed down. Just like it's something as simple as a head nod. You know how... 
how guys, I experienced it this weekend in, in Gatlinburg, walking to a restaurant and walked around the corner and uh, some couples sitting at the table and the men, the men, uh, well, one of the men looked at me and we give a nod. You know that mm-hmm. nod, right? Yeah. The nod. That's that's in our DNA. That's not, yeah. I'm not consciously saying, hey, I'm going to nod to this guy. It's a nod and what it, I mean, it's part of our animal instincts. Yeah. The nod down protects the net, the neck, and it's it's and, and if we do a nod up, it's like, you know. Well, I have heard that a nod up means you know them. Yes, and and you're comfortable with them, and a nod down means you don't know them, but you can see something in them you respect. Yes, kind of like. Yes, it's uh, a nod down. It's a it's an acknowledgement. A, yeah, a life understands a life. Like you've been through shit. I've been through shit. Mm-hmm. There you go. And and to go further, like the nod down, because I don't know you, I'm going to go in a protective posture of I'm protecting my neck. Mm-hmm. And the nod up is I know you, no need for alarm, yeah. no need for that survival. Yeah. You know? And it's in us. It's yeah. in us. Like, I want to think like, hey, man, I'm just a good old country boy. I'm going to nod to this man. We're going to acknowledge each other that, hey, if shit goes down in this restaurant, <laughs> I see you, you see me. That's what I, I mean. And part of that is... Uh. But it's it's in our DNA. It's mm-hmm. in our it's it's like it's it's in my subconscious. Like I'm just I'm gonna nod to someone. Yeah. Not everyone. Yeah. And it's not everyone. Yeah. It's involuntary. Yeah. But there is a certain there's a certain I I, I would say respect in that as well. Just mm-hmm. a, a I see you mm-hmm. and you see me. Yeah. You were talking about when you were you know look outside at night mm-hmm. the chaos in the house. You've got trauma planted in you and your DNA from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. You weren't around in Vietnam. You were a toddler when the Vietnam, you were an infant when the Vietnam War ended. Yet your dad's trauma and PTSD was passed down into you through the experiences that you had. The experiences he had. Yeah, the experiences yeah. that he had. So then when, when, when you first, what was the first thing you used? Uh, alcohol. I, I drank when I was, uh, I think, uh, 15 to 16 or right at 16. I drank like a six pack of Budweiser. Right, get it sick. Was, I didn't get sick, no, but I, I, I was free. I will say, like right. I, I can still remember. I, I drank that, and then uh, I fought with my best friend. I think I hit him in the face, and I'd never be violent, but it was a certain freedom. He, I thought he stole my Copenhagen. Definitely in that moment, felt a, a freedom that I had not known up to that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really wanted to do things with my life at that point. And I worked really hard at it, but I, there, I couldn't replay. I couldn't say that that had not been the best I had ever felt. And I wanted to do it again. Mm -hmm. I definitely knew that. Mm -hmm. And I would eventually do it again, you know, starting on the weekends, you know, after a game party, close it down and go to school. But then it started to become more and more and more. By the time I went to college, I played football in college too, but I never, I never amounted to the the hard work and talent that I had was never really seen on the field because the addiction and alcoholism was really ramping up at the mm-hmm. same time, and that was the priorities change, and uh, the the work I had put in it, it could only take me so far, and it took me as far as it could, and then the Drugs and alcohol. I mean, I started to become daily, daily, daily. And uh, then I, after I quit playing football in college, I got in, started bartending cocaine. That became, that's when I really knew. Up to that point, I thought I was kind of normal, maybe like a, uh, a party guy, smoking weed every day, drinking. But the I could still make it to class every now and then, still kind of date normal girls. Um, when I got into cocaine, that was like a, a it, uh, this little pocket here on my pants. I think I had a baggie in that thing for 10 years. Mm-hmm. I know exactly um, what you mean. Everywhere. I couldn't go anywhere without it. I couldn't drink without it. If I drank without cocaine, I'd be drunk within an hour, like violently antisocial. I needed that mm-hmm. because the way I drank, I didn't, I drank alcoholically. I, I, ne- I, I would drink. Anything and everything, all of it. I still remember my friends would pass out two o'clock in the morning. We'd have coolers full of beer, and I would drink. I would finish off everybody's cooler. That could be 40, 60. Be Bartles and James wine coolers, Zima, <laughs> Budweiser. I didn't care. It right. Was un, I was insatiable. But I'd have to also be doing some upper along with it. To, to maintain. Yeah. 
I always called it baby bear's porridge. Right. Just right. Just you know, right. I want to be right there. This one's the a little too hot. Yeah. This is a little too cold. Yeah. This is just right. A little yeah. blow, a little, little, lot of alcohol and a yeah. lot, lot of blow. Yeah. It's just right. And Baby that, bear porridge. Yeah. In, in present. And, you know, what I did is I always found myself alone. That was the thing. Like, other people were around me, but I was like a werewolf. You know, I did, as soon as I got that in me, but that being in the present and just only living for that moment, that's a, there's a freedom in that. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that people really understand that's what's going on for addicts and alcoholics. Like, they're free for the first time. If you felt the way they felt when they didn't have alcohol in their system or drugs, you'd understand why they do it. Definitely. You really would. And you wouldn't question it. You might not agree with it, but you'd understand that they are being released from a pain that that they don't that they could never understand. Yeah. They're I didn't know I had to, that. No. I didn't know I had the pain. No. Like I looking back, I mean I had some know. stuff it's the happen. Only one you know. Yeah, some stuff happened to me before I started using. Mm-hmm. I had some stuff happen to me. And just like you were talking about that moment of freedom when I'm present in the moment for the first time was when I smoked that joint and I felt a part of for the first time. I felt comfortable in my own skin for the first time. I felt, I felt okay. Mm-hmm. And I, just like you, I didn't go off and do it every single day, but every chance I got, I did because I wanted to be in the present moment. And I wanted to be okay right where my feet were planted. You know? And there's a certain... I think in the beginning, there's a certain intimacy that happens with other people that you get high with and drink with. Like you kind of see each other, Mm -hmm. even though it's veiled a bit and over time it really loses its shine. But most of our interactions as kids and young people are really superficial. Yeah. You know, you're not looking people in the eyes a whole bunch. And, you know, we used to skip school and go smoke weed at the rifle range and we'd buy Mickey's Big Mouse and we'd, you know, take the top off and put it on our, you know, clip it to our ear. We just had a lot of fun, you know, we'd smoke weed and hang out there and uh, we'd have deep conversations Mm -hmm. about what we were going to do with our life. We get vulnerable with each other. Yeah. And that, that just wasn't happening other than that. And um, I, you know, there's, I'd always get kind of, you know, like I'd get high and then I'd get hooked up with some person and, you know, we talk all night, you know, we bring up all the, Shit in the world. Now, that's why it's working for you. Yeah. That's when it was working for you. Mm-hmm. It was doing exactly what it was supposed to do. Like, it works. Everybody that contacts me is like, he's got a problem with drugs and alcohol. I'm like, that's not his problem. It's what he's using as his solution. Like, mm-hmm. it was working for him for a while now. Yeah. It's turned on him. When did it start turning on you? And what did that look like? Oh, it turned on me really quickly. Really quick. But I, I, I still slogged through it. I think... um I had been doing cocaine only like, I was 21, and I'd only been doing it about nine months when I lost my septum. Like, uh, I fell asleep one night at a party uh, with a girl on the couch, and we woke up. I woke up to her screaming and looking at me in the morning, and I was like, what? And I looked down, there's just a pool of blood and tissue, like human tissue, all over my body. Like, like she thought I was dead because it was covered in blood all down my chest and my neck, throat. And uh, what I realized is that my septum had fallen apart that night. It had, it had disintegrated and melted from doing too much of it. I'd only been doing it less than a year at that point. So I still to this day don't have, you know, I can touch my fingers together. I don't have a septum. I have a little bit up there, but it's different, <laughs> different than others. And um, I made a 0.0 in college that next semester, and then I followed that up with another 0.0 because I was too lost to even go withdraw from my classes while there was still time to do it. Just totally unmanageable. Yeah. I mean, I I became a has-been really quick. And uh, up till that point, you know, I was a popular kid. Like I said, I played sports. I, you know, I was in a fraternity, which it was in a small school, small college, uh, great school. But, man, I was just falling apart. And before that, you know, I got kicked out of school. I eventually got to go back and finish and do all that, which has been a blessing. It hit me fast and it hit me hard, and I did not know how to stop. I did not. That became the only normal life for me. I was living on artificial energy, and I didn't know how to. It's just like a, it's like a toy, if you you know that takes batteries. You know, you got the batteries in it. Is I'm 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 ready to go. If if you remove 
alcohol and cocaine, methamphetamines from my system. It's like you took the toys, you took the batteries out of the toy. There was no life in me. I, I, there was no, I could look at myself in the mirror and what I saw in my eyes, there was nothing. There was nothing looking back at it, dead as, dead as could be. No life, no vibrancy, no energy. Um, just kind of like a shell of a person. And uh, I gave up. There was a certain point where I quit fighting it. I knew it was consuming me. I knew it had consumed me, and the darkness just took me over. And even though in my heart I know I'm a good person, I experienced a lot of darkness over the last, like I'd say, 10 years, but really like the last five to six years, I reached levels that I I didn't think humans could really reach. Paint a picture for us, man. Um, When you give up on yourself... Like when you truly give up and say, I'm going to die this way, things don't mean the same as they did before. So you put yourself in situations that may kill you, may kill other people. Um, you put yourself, uh, you, it's not like you take care of your body anymore. You might expose yourself to other people who are sick, and just use the same things that they do. Uh, you might, um, You might not take care of yourself sexually. You know, like uh, anything can happen there. You become – it's like when I was younger, I had this, like, fundamental idea of God. I was brought up in, like, the Catholic Church and everything. That never really – that never really grabbed me in the same way that my relationship now is. But I felt like I was protected. I felt like I had like a like a force field around me, you know, like there was really something protecting me from all the evil in the world. Because I've had evil follow me from a child, my early childhood. I mean, I had darkness around me all the time, and it would take hours to go through that. Real palpable darkness. I, I experienced that as a child. I went through a lot, not just violence at home, but a, a lot of different things in childhood. And um. But I felt like there was something, some kind of force field. And when I lost all that faith and I just began to live, you know, from hand to mouth every day, that force field was gone. It was like I was just taking every arrow in the world and somehow just making it through each day. But there was no hope that it was going to get better. There was no, like, fight within me left. There was, a, there was like a maybe a faint glimmer but it was just so faint I could never even feel it or see it anymore. And so I put myself, you know, in the end, you know, I ended up, you know, doing drugs with like the Aryan Brotherhood because it was like the only people that would work with me anymore. It's like people that would be like, hey, go steal this, go steal this, go do this, and we'll we'll give you some dope. And then, you know, I'd get finally get the dope, I'd fall asleep, and they'd steal it from me. <laughs> you know, like... That's what it would be like. It, uh, I I don't know how I wasn't killed. I mean, I've had guns pulled on me. I've had been kicked down flights of stairs. I've been like, I've been a, I've been put in situations that wasn't a couple debating on killing you one night. Yeah, I was held hostage for days. Yeah, you. Yeah. To, what and the I hell? Got, I got taken out in the middle of nowhere, and and uh and uh, the the guy was in the back seat, and I felt it. What do you mean you felt it? I felt when you're gonna die. I've had right. you know, I nearly got killed in New Orleans and I got jumped in New Orleans too, you know, when I was twenty two or so. And I felt it that night. It's like the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And he said something to me that let me know we were on family land and this was it. Not my family, his family. Mm-hmm. Been there for I don't know, centuries, but a long time. And I knew that they thought I'd stolen from them, and I and I and I can remember I said I give up heaven to tell you I didn't steal your money, and that's what came to me, and he let me go. So I think in that moment he knew I was telling the truth, and I believe God gave me those words. Maybe I have given up heaven. I don't know. I don't believe so. I don't think so. But I um in that moment I would have sold I would have sold my soul to get out of it, and I did. You know it. This is. There's a there's a a big soul retrieval that happens through the recovery process. You know, through we're getting back parts that we gave away. You know, 
I'm always out harvesting more parts that I gave away, repairing situations and relationships that were damaged. You know, because I got to get those soul parts of my soul back from them. Because you know, when I did them wrong, I loaned out parts of my soul. I learned out parts of my energy. And when I make that right, when I pay that money back, when I take ownership of the the pain that I caused them, I get part of my soul back. I That's become whole again. And it's it's real. It's beyond the you know you can't necessarily see it. But it's something that's happened. I mean, if we could really see the energetic world that's going on around us, I mean, we can always see this like form, our human right. form. We feel things, like you said, like the nod, like that is a certain feeling that happens between us. But if we, I think if we could really see the energetic exchanges that are happening all the time, I mean, I, I can only imagine what they are. But to me, I, I, I truly believe that we are doing things, we are always changing exchanging energy in every interaction that we have and it can either be uh, uh moving you in a in a positive momentum or, or losing momentum you know each each interaction i have each thing i say each thing i think each thing i do they all have momentum either for it or against it and it's not necessarily good or bad it's just kind of like things move And when I leave an exchange knowing that I didn't give my best or that I said something that may have hurt somebody, I need to go repair it. If I tell a lie or if I paint a picture that's not true, I need to go repair it. I believe that really honesty is is by far the most like fundamental building block for life because I'll never see reality if I'm not honest. Because if I paint a picture, let's say I tell you this story about me, and it's uh, it's not true, then I painted a picture by which you are going to build a framework that you're you're going to see me a certain way, and then you're going to treat me a certain way the rest of my life based on this story. But if it wasn't true, then I've 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 got to li- I've created like another universe, and each universe I've got to live in. When I'm around you, I've got to be in the universe that I've created for you. When I'm around her, I got to be in the universe I've created with her and it creates so much problems, then it becomes impossible to be present. Like I talked about earlier, like you can't be present when you've, you're in 10 different universes simultaneously, a yeah. hundred different universes. So like just the, the journey to like authenticity or just being who truly who you are, the stories are crazy enough. I mean, most of us have been through enough pain. We might compare ourselves to somebody else like, shit, dude, this guy's got a crazy story. I've never done half that shit. But if you really look at yourself, we've all been mangled. There's not a human being alive that's had it perfect. Um, and the, most of the people that ha- think they've had it perfect are some of the most traumatized individuals that I've worked with yeah. on an individual level. When I got sober, there was always this thought that when somebody was, wasn't, was resistant to treatment or was resistant to help or they were fighting it, that they hadn't had their ass whooped enough. Hey, you'd listen to me if you'd had your ass whooped. In truth, what I've seen is trauma can happen before you even remember it. They do. There's developmental trauma. It's called NARM, Neuroaffective Relational Model. It talks about trauma from in utero to like five years old. We're already collecting information as soon as we're conscious. Mm -hmm. We're conscious before we're born. But we might not recognize the pain that we've been through. And just like I talk about the, you know, my dad's DNA being downloaded into me, like there's, they've shown that, and I don't want to misquote this, but they're showing uh, Holocaust survivors that most of their ancestry, like the, the grandsons, granddaughters have an anxiety level that's different than most people because what their predecessors had been through, because they've been through such pain. And so that stuff's real. It's really happening. And so to say that somebody's not had their ass whooped enough, I think it's just like it's 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 kind of a cop out. It's like we they'll die before they get their ass whooped enough. Today in today's age with fentanyl, that's like Russian roulette with five bullets in the chamber. Mm-hmm. It's not if, it's when. You're right. Somebody's not gonna have their ass whooped in a proper manner before the death comes calling for them. To think that I gotta wait for that moment, it's just, you. that's not reality anymore. It's been moved up. So I've got to learn to reach people before they realize they need to be reached completely, before they understand that everything's wrong and it's falling apart. 
There's a part of their soul that knows that already, though. Yeah. A lot of times people say, oh, he's too young. He's not going to hear it. I believe our bodies are all different ages, but our souls are the same age. Mm -hmm. And sooner or later, your soul is going to scream for something different. So whether they're 17, 14, 70 years old, nobody can be too old. Nobody can be too young to, to change their life. And I, I don't ever want to look at somebody by that cover. You know the, the the light bulb. I just cut. You know, I heard it said one time. Uh, it, Parahamsa Yogananda was one of the things that one of those moments from my life that kind of changed it. Um, he was speaking about death, and he said that uh, electricity doesn't cease to exist just because the light bulb burned out. And that like gave me a lot of comfort for those I had lost, but it also made me realize like this is energy, and that which animates me doesn't ever go away. This light bulb, this this body, this shell, you know, has a shelf life. It can only go so long, but the the energy that animates us isn't going anywhere. And um, I believe that getting sober is like for a human experience. It's the most impactful thing that a human soul can happen in a lifetime. Is to get sober. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's nothing that compares to that. Yeah. Like because it opens up. You have one, basically one door, and that door is death. Yeah. But you get sober, and then there's like a million doors open up to you, and you step through one more, and there's a million more that open. Yeah. It's like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Yeah. And you but know what without else? Without it, you can't have it. Yeah. Well, what it also is, like, I can take some comfort now knowing that, I mean, I'm pretty solid on this belief that I have is, is that there's nothing that can come down the pike worse than what I've experienced. I'm talking loss of loved ones. I mean, if my if my family was wiped out, that would be horrific and I would grieve and I would be distraught and I would go through all of those emotions and loss. But still, even that, I don't think that even compares to the pain and the suffering and the saga and the drama and the chaos that I experienced in active addiction. So I take some comfort knowing as everyone's all anxious about the elections and the state of the union and the state of the world, it's like, I take some code like, man, there's nothing that's going to come along worse than what I've experienced ever. Yeah. I want to live a life where I'm impervious to the external. And that's not to say that things don't hurt because they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've gone through some big time pain in my life, especially in the last few years, but I can't like, I know that it's, it's, it's all in and there's nothing that exchanging that pain for, drugs and alcohol would do for me like it's raw you got to do it raw there's no way around it you're going to have to walk through it but through that I'm always building momentum every day that I get up and do what I'm supposed to do every day that I go within and I ask for the guidance of the day that's building a power and a momentum within me and a, and a presence within me that I wouldn't have and the pain only makes it more intense because I got to go in more I've got to go in more often I've got to try to see to get through it because there's no there's no running anymore that's a that's another thing about getting sober is just there's no comfort in hurting myself like i understand harming myself what that does and i don't want to be the recipient of that life is you know it's be, life is lifey. You're going to go through things. Like even, you know, just because just cause I got sober doesn't mean I'm going to be on a winning streak the whole rest of my life. It just, that's not the way it works. Life turns and churns and sometimes you're in the barrel and sometimes you're not. And um, I know though that if if that's going to draw me closer to God, if that's going to move me away from what I thought life was, and more into reality, then I'm growing. And at some point, I'll pop through to a plateau where I say, oh, it's a little rest here, just mm -hmm. a little comfort in the mm -hmm. present moment. Being prepared and a little rest for the next thing that's going to yeah, come along and not... try to kick your ass. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there is, the, the, there's plateaus, but there, there's no stop, there's no mm -hmm. end. Um, you, you're always in a, in a position of, because the stairs down seem to be un limitless, the stairs up seem to be limitless too. It's like a mirage that we're seeking this utopia that it's going to be like we're going like we can reach this place of it's just going to be level from here on. I out. see it as it's 
every level I move up, I become more and more responsible. Mm-hmm. I'm, and when I mean responsible, I mean able to respond. Like I heard it said that way. Sad Guru said it that way. A guy really. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. You know, I he said him yes. For a long time. No. Hello. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love that guy. Yeah. Love that guy. But he talks about being able to respond yeah. to whatever the situation calls for. That's really being alive. So the more chambers of hell I've been through, the more I'm able to respond. Because the more, the longer I'm sober, the longer I'm an active participant in this world and go through more pain and more suffering, more freedom. But I'm called on to do more as a person. And my ability to expand to whatever comes to me, I feel like is it's there. Like I'll be ready. Mm-hmm. I am ready. I'm living in constant readiness for whatever that phone call brings, whatever that comes. And and if I'm called to do something bigger than I think I can do, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm mm-hmm. just going to give it what I have mm-hmm. and let the chips fall where they may. But I believe that this life, I've been given another life. You know, I basically had two lives in one. I got to burn one all the way to the ground and I got a whole new one. Well, I got to do something with this one. And you get a different perspective on the life that you burnt to the ground. Yeah, I realize viewing it, it from from yeah, your new life. I'm not a victim of it. You know, uh, you'd ask me when I first, you know, was out there getting high. You know, there was a reason I was this way. That I, I I'm a victim of the circumstances of my life, and now I realize, like to me, I believe that I chose it. I don't believe I'm a victim to it, and I don't believe it's like a choice that I get high. I'm not saying that. I don't believe that's a choice. But I'm saying on a soul level, my soul knew what it was getting into when it came into this life, and it needed to learn lessons, and it was being called on to do more. So it needed to experience the pain and the suffering, because somehow I got to turn all that shit into gold. Yeah, that's why I said in the beginning is that you know you're a true healer. I mean, I, I'll go to my grave thinking that about you is that Jason Chain is a healer, and and he's connected. You had to go through those trials and tribulations to groom you, to polish you, to to hone you down to to where you're able to be the healer. Like I think, do you believe that things are kind of planned from the start? I don't know if they're planned. I, I believe it's a, you know kind of almost like a choose your own adventure book. And and believe me, <laughs> um, what I'm saying now, a year from now, I may not believe it at all. Yeah. I mean, it's everything's subject to change. I haven't figured it out in any form or fashion today. I believe like there's options and I can move in certain directions, but some of it's, they they talk about genetic being predisposed, you know, predetermined, but that doesn't mean they can't change. And that's the greatest thing about doing trauma work that I I believe is like that DNA that I was born to, I can change it. Yeah. So what I pass on to my children can be an amended version of that. They don't have to have the same fears and the same uh, pieces that I have. They can have that knowledge but it doesn't have to adversely affect them where they're scared to do things. Because to me, that's what trauma really is. It's not always the event that happened. It's the story I tell myself about myself from experiencing that event that prevents me from living a life full. Right. Like um, I was, you know, I went through molestation as a child, and that told me that I was dirty. That's the message I took from it. So later on in life, when it became time to date and stuff like that, I I, I always felt intimidated by the girls that seemed to be perfect or good, like good families, good upbringing, good, um, beautiful. Uh, not to say that girls that I dated weren't beautiful, but I was intimidated by that that goodness because I felt like I wasn't equal to them. And I was. But what I had endured as a child told me a story about me that wasn't true. I'm not dirty, but I thought I was. That affected my life. Yeah, because you chased? you Who made that agreement. After? You made that agreement right then without even really realizing you made that agreement and you just said that that's so. This is this is absolutely true. I am dirty and then you start moving through life reacting to the voice that your head's telling you that I'm dirty. I mean the Every decision we make is painted by our experience, our trauma that we've been through, how we vote, what we think about a vaccine or not a vaccine, all those things. They're based on what we've experienced, Mm -hmm. what we've been downloaded into us, what we've done ourselves, what our parents have taught us. Like It molds that belief system. And if I can't get free of that, if I can't do the work that actually busts that wide open and says, who are you really? Then... I'm always trapped and limited by that. So I see trauma as limiting me. 
because it tells me a story about me that it it took away all you know of if there were a hundred women that I could have dated, it took out eighty of them, and that is that's reality. Mm-hmm. It happens to all of us. For some people, you know, I had a, a a friend of mine whose teacher told him he was stupid when he was in second grade. Well, you know what? He never went to high school. He gave up on it. He's brilliant. Right. But that story, he bought it. He bought it. It came. It was very forceful, and he went through a lot to get that story. But he bought it, and it told him a story about him. Now he's thriving, but he's had to do a ton of work on himself. He sent the, that point. the teacher probably had a bad day. Yeah, didn't have anything to do with him at all whatsoever. Spit that poison at him. He took it, swallowed it. And she didn't actually tell him he was stupid. It's the message he took from the actions that she took. Mm-hmm. She took an action. She brought him outside and had all the kids march to him and tell him that he needed to learn his stuff because he couldn't remember it. Mm-hmm. One after one, and like 20 kids said, you need to learn your flashcards. You need to learn your flashcards. And it, it, when he told me that story, I was just like, wow. Because I knew him as an adult, and I knew what I considered to be limitations that he was experiencing because of that, because he was told a story that wasn't true, but it had painted his life, and it sent him down a corridor that was very small where there were, could have been a lot of other options, he did that. And that's it's truly like what I'm opening up to being fully human and our capabilities of what we have. Most of us are just limited by our story, by what we've been taught, what we tell ourselves about ourselves. And that's not to say that I'm 100% free of it. I'm only partially free of a bit of it. Like, I believe that's what truly like saints and people that we revere, they really have shaken off all that. Mm-hmm. They realize their true divinity. They realize God resides within them, and they are 100% capable of that, of whatever that power means when it's really truly moving through you without limitations. And um, I've experienced points where I felt that true connection, but most of the time my fears will come back and say, oh, that's not possible. That's not real. Who are you to think that? And that's my conditioning. And that's not to say that I'm 100% free of it because I'm not, but every now and then I get glimpses of like, yeah. um, I really, I admire people that can kind of go through life and at least have the appearance of not giving a shit. Right. Cause I, I believe it's truly when you're most effective. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, you can't really do what God made you to do when you, when you're scared to put it out there, yeah. when you're scared, it's going to scare off this amount of people or this amount of people or this amount of people. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, but, and I believe in, in this day and age we're free of some of that but we're also still bound by it Mm because you can get canceled at any time Mm -hmm. for saying the wrong thing about this or that it's really scary Mm -hmm. Um, but I believe that's really killing authenticity in some ways like I would love the ability for people because I I believe we're up against a lot right now just in humanity environment you know how are we going to take care of this world mental health all those those big issues right now that we really need people that aren't afraid to take lead in that, to, to move in a direction of like, let's be real here. What's mm-hmm. going on? Right. You know, people are falling apart. And there's only so many people that have been through hell that can reach those people that are falling apart. And those people got to step up. You've been through hell. You went through Dante's and was it Dante's <laughs> Inferno, right? Yeah. I mean, you were talking a little bit about that and not a little bit about that. You're talking about it. You, you, you went down to that darkness. What it looked like right at the end? How'd you get out of it? The end was I was left on a street corner in Waco, Texas, and uh, with nothing. At that point, I, you know, like I nothing. All these hot, nothing. I had, I had a, set of, a, a set of clothes on, but no money. I had a, had a pipe. I had a glass pipe, but I had torched that thing. Like it, it was newer than the day. It, it was, it was cleaner than the day I bought it. I had burned finger, you know, you couldn't see my fingerprints because I burned them off. Um, and I was running with the Aryan Brotherhood, and they stole my truck for the umpteenth time, and left me on that street corner. And I was in a, it was a, a eight liner game room, and I I walked into the game room, and I knew as soon as I saw those tail lights, I was like, he ain't, he ain't coming back, and I really got nothing. And the cops are breathing down my neck because I've written, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars worth of hot checks in about two weeks, on my own name. And that's coming back. You ain't getting away with that. And I thought I, thought I was going to move to Mexico and I was going to do all these things to get out of it, but you know, drug addicts can't make plans work. Mm-hmm. 
And I went into that game room and I just sat there and I fell asleep for a few days in there. And then finally the, the owners were like, hey, man, you can't stay here anymore. I was like, I got nowhere to go. And they're like, hey, you can come stay with us for a while. They told me I ended up sleeping eight days on their couch. Eight days, eight solid. Days. Eight solid, days solid. Solid eight days. I used to stay up for like a month at a time. No bullshit. Like I'd mm. fall asleep going to the bathroom or driving. Mm-hmm. It'd be the only time I'd fall asleep. It'd be the only time I'd be off, still off enough. it enough, still enough. Because I, you know, I was completely and utterly tired, but just surviving. But I was truly out of drugs at that point. And, um, and finally, after the eighth day, you know, the guy was like, listen, man, you've been asleep eight days. I wanted to help you. You're a true drug addict, man. He's like, you need help. Do you have anybody that loves you that you can call? And I had been estranged from my parents for over, uh, you know, six months to a year at that point. Missing persons, calling in my truck, stolen. They were trying to do whatever they could through the authorities to find me. I, I knew I had my mom's number memorized, and uh, and I called her, and she answered. And I was like, Mom, she's like, where are you? And I said, I'm at the Tennis and Arms Apartments. And she's like, stay right there, I'm coming. She came and got me. And that was the day before Thanksgiving uh, in 2005. And then later on in December, I got to go to treatment to a free, I got a free bed at a, you know, basically a homeless shelter treatment center. Did you stay sober from the time she picked you up till the time you went to treatment? No, I did. I did smoke weed. My sister gave me, she used to roll me blunts, her and her boyfriend. I, it got me through probably. I was Mm -hmm. a basket case. I saw things in that last few months that to this day I know are real, and they were spiritually as scary as a human can see. I, I've crossed over into another threshold, another portal, where the darkness completely took me. I'd keep a watch on, and it would be it would run fast. Like everything, everything energetic with me was 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 out of skew. I couldn't imagine life without it. I didn't really think it was going to work. I mean, I, I don't really believe that any of us really believes it can work mm-hmm. fully. It's so far out there when you think about it. Yeah. Especially when we're in that darkness where we are. Yes. I believed I'd already given my soul up. Yeah. I believe I gave my soul to darkness and that that there was no way to get it back. Right. The things I had done, the things I had seen, the things I had let happen in front of me, my humanity was gone. And that's where spiritual bankruptcy comes in is that giving out your soul every, you're leaving it behind and casting it aside and trading it, bartering it. The job is. When given this new life, I need to square the books. Right. And then I want, you know, by the time this light bulb burns out, I want to make sure that I put more positive in than I right. do. Man, I hear stories about you from guys that, man, Jason, he's just, he owns this treatment program down in Florida, and it, like he's the owner, and we'll be at a meeting. He's out there picking up cigarette butts out of the, <laughs> off the parking lot. Everywhere we go, he's picking up cigarette butts. He's like, I got to put it back into the world. I took a lot out of this world. I got to put it back. Yeah, I try to do th- my 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 goal has always been three a day, three cigarette butts a day, just because I threw so many out of the car, I threw mis- so many on the ground, and that that's just my amends to the it's one of my amends to the earth, and I just and that's the thing too. Once you start picking up cigarettes, you see them everywhere. <laughs> then you can't be asleep. You know, I just like I said, I go on a walk down right. Waikiki, and you know, a lot of times. Uh, you know, I, a lot of times I won't be wearing a shirt. I won't be wearing shoes or just I'll be wearing a pair of shorts. That's my outfit. That's why I love Hawaii. It's right. real basic. You know, right. I got to think about what I'm going to wear in Hawaii. It's right. nothing. <laughs> so they're thinking you know, you're out there homeless looking for cigarettes. I had a guy offer me some food the other day. <laughs> um, I was, you know, picking up butts. And, you know, I think he thought maybe I was going to collect them to smoke them. But, <laughs> uh, you know, and there was a day when I would have done that. You you're know, like, I, you're I, like... I picked up plenty of butts off the ground with a little bit left in them and right. let them up. You know, oh, hell yeah. I had to do that, you know. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, I smoked that, plywood. I was in jail one time, uh-huh. and I took plywood off the TV stand <laughs> and crumbled it up because it looked like, and I was detoxing. I was out of my mind. Yeah, I crumbled it up because it looked like that dark golden tobacco, you yeah. know, from Philip Morris, and I rolled it up in some toilet paper, and <laughs> it was not. Probably pressure it was still treated. Wood. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. It was plywood. <laughs> yeah, it got the glue and all that in there. Got the nickname Woody from that. Everybody in the, in the pod called me Woody oh, from that yeah. day on, you yeah. know, but... Yeah, so they, you, you're like, nah, man, I'm a business owner. I'm, yeah. I don't need any food. I, you want to go out to lunch? Yeah. We'll do that. And yeah. We talk but about I, the spirit of the universe. But there's a certain there's a certain aspect of that I like though, because I love to, for somebody to never see me coming like that. I don't want to be in a way where somebody can completely figure me out right off mm-hmm. the bat. You know, like uh, 
You're I pulling like that I off. Have a little bit of mystery. You're pulling that yeah. off, man. You're, you're you're doing fine. <laughs> you're on you're on target. Yeah. You're on target yeah. in a great way, though. In a great way, great way. I mean, just from the get go, things started to to turn. You know, I I rode the bus to work. I uh, I, I, I was an overnight checker. I made like eight dollars an hour. Then I became a telemarketer. And then I, you know, I just worked my way up from zero. I was a hundred thousand dollars in debt when I got sober. It took four years to pay that off, and I had a blessing of somebody helped me too, pay off, help me pay off about half of it. But I had a lot of amazing things happen in my life, and I got free. And um, this life has been charming ever since. It's not to say that I haven't had a lot of pitfalls because I have, but praying and meditating every day for almost nineteen years now. Is given me a, a freedom and a and a an awareness that I I never had before. I don't know what other people have, but I know I feel like in life I, most of the time I'm playing offense and not defense. Like I see things coming, I feel them. Mm-hmm. I normally know when to zig and not when to zag. Not always do I act on it because fear keeps me in. You, we talked about that this morning. Why wouldn't you be doing that? Mm-hmm. Fear. Mm-hmm. I know better. But the fear still keep me in a place, but I know I'm aware. And at some point, I get tired of staying in the same place and I move. Mm-hmm. And that time has gotten less and less. I used to just be frozen all the time. Yeah. That's what, growing up with my dad, that's what I learned to do. I didn't even run, I didn't fight, I froze. Right. Stuck. Right. And in many ways in my life, I can still get stuck. That's yes. my go to. I don't do anything. But. Now action takes place more often in event, and I get to that place faster than I used to. So when did you know that you were meant to? I, I mean, I don't know how you feel about me calling you a healer, but I believe that, that, that God uses you as a healer. I truly believe that. Like I said, I trust you with my, I've sent you family members of mine. Um. Because I just I can feel your energy and I like this guy's real. This guy's legit. This guy's a healer. I mean, I've seen you in action. When did you know that that God was going to use you through a treatment center to that this was your this was your journey to open up a program? I mean, uh, from a from my childhood, I always felt that need to to help. I always now that I'd never had the venue for it, and I never knew how. Sobriety was the thing that brought it home for me, and I never knew what I was supposed to do with my life till I got sober. And then I realized that's what I—that's what I was born to do. I was born to help people that are lost, just like me. And addiction is pre- prevalent. You know what? It could be food, sex. It could, we're all yeah. addicted. I mean, look at a phone. Yeah. There, there's not a more addictive substance on earth than a phone right now. It's got everybody's attention. It's got everybody's present moment. And it, you know, if if it's free, you're the product. That's how it goes. And we're all on that. So I think we can all understand that there's a certain level of our life that we're giving away to something that may not have the the same return that we're giving it. And um, that's why I do this is because, I mean, we're all on this right here. Yeah. And I want to at least do my – it would be great if we none of us were on it. But I have connected with a lot of people that I never would have met. I've had opportunities come my way that I never would have had. I have assisted people that I'll never met or ever know that have sent me messages and say, hey, thanks for this, thanks for that, that I never would have met in my life, so there's good in it. Just like a baseball bat could be used to yeah. hit, a, hit a home run and could be used to case somebody's head in. You yeah, know, I've, like heard there's, like, there's, I've heard it like, a, you know, electricity. It can light a kindergarten or a brothel. You know, yeah. It doesn't care. yeah, there you go. You know? Right? <laughs> like um, a kindergarten or a brothel, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, Stuart Wilde said that. He's yeah. no longer here either. But, yeah, I don't have any issues with – uh, being called healer or being called any of that, because to me it's just a word, and it's also it's true in some ways. But I don't believe that talent is just mine. I believe we all have it. Mm-hmm. It's like I do. I study, you know, shaman work, not plant medicine shaman work, but like true shaman work with drumming. And not to say that plant medicine work isn't true shamanism, but I the the work that I do has to do with drumming to get into a meditative state rather than plant medicine. But I believe everybody's a shaman. Everybody has that ability. We all have that ability. That small, still voice is within all of us, and we all have the ability to heal. But it's how do I get quiet enough to learn how to use that energy? Mm-hmm. How do I become free enough of all the things that have bound me 
that constrict me from being able to use that energy. So I don't believe that I'm special in a way that maybe I'm just a more aware of what I, the gifts that I have because I've uncovered a few of them and I believe in them. There's certain things I second out that I second guess in the world, but being able to sit with somebody and, and leave a positive imprint on them is not something that I second guess. I know in my heart that that's real. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I believe it's my duty. I believe that, you know, that's, that's why I'm awake. That's why I'm still here. I have things to give. And you got a duty to do. Mm-hmm. There's a famous Civil War general who said, one must always do his duty. He should not wish to do more. No, he should not wish to do less. Should not be expected to do more. Yeah. But do your duty. Yeah. So, man, that brings me into, it's, it's not every day that, or any, just anyone can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to open up a place for healing for men. Like, how'd that happen? And, and what's, that, what's that been looking like for you? Well, at about two and a half years after I got sober, I got fired from a job, a sales job, because I, I couldn't sell it. <laughs> I, I went dry for a spell, and the guy just said, hey, Jason, you're a good guy and everything, but I got to find somebody in here who can move this, and you're not moving it, so I'm going to let you go. And I was shocked. I, I, I was upset because it was it was still the best money job I had ever had, and I had been volunteering at this uh at this Salvation Army every Thursday night. Um, we would go every Thursday, and the guy that I would do it with, uh, we were driving to it one night after I'd gotten fired and was like, I can't, I hadn't found a job. And he's like, Jason, he's like, there's a treatment center out in Maynard, Texas, that's hiring for a counselor, and I think you'd be great at it. You love doing this stuff. You should apply for that. And I thought, well, how much do they get paid? And he said, it doesn't matter how much they get paid. You're meant to do this kind of stuff, and You'll make money eventually. I fell in love with it from the get go. When I'm meeting with a guy and challenging him, and it's, I felt like a football coach. I felt like what I always had kind of been. Like I, I know how to motivate people and get them through stuff and challenge them. And I learned how to run something from soup to nuts. You know, from the from the beginning, all the positions. And I did all the family work, did all the talks, I did all the groups, did all the individuals. Did everything, and I realized like there's not much more to this than that. Like, now there's a whole business side that I didn't understand. I'm a smart guy, but I'm not 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 a a, a hardcore let's kill it business guy. But how to how to how to run a healing center? I had that. It was a natural thing for me, and I had the experience of it. And so eventually, I had to end up running a place formally. But I knew in my heart that I was going to open my own place because no matter, I think in some ways, like I always knew, like no matter where I worked, it's never fully identified who I was. Uh, The truth of it is, is like when somebody comes to me, they're on a divine appointment and I got to figure out how to reach them in the best way that I have possible. Because somehow I feel like that's like a contract between me and God. It's like, oh, God, why'd you choose us? That can be scary, too. Yeah. It'd be scary to be in that situation where you know that you're out here doing God's work and he's going to put somebody in your life that that you're like, and I've had that before. It's like, whoa, what am I going to do here? And that doesn't mean that you're always appropriately matched. You know, you might need to find special help for them. You might need to refer them out if you can't do everything, but that needs to be uncovered. You have to be able to like really weigh like, how are we going to reach this person? Because my job, I've taken on a, a financial obligation to the family to them, to the client, uh, and then also, the, you know, like I say, it's a divine appointment. I say, well, you know, God, how, why why this guy end up in my spider web? Mm-hmm. He could have ended up anywhere. There's so many options. How do you end up with me? What is it that I, what is it in this short time that we have, what is it that that we are going to do here? And so looking at it like that, so people don't come to us surrendered. They don't. They don't come to us like, I'll do anything you say, Jason. They get they bitch about this, they bitch about that. It's a memory foam mattress. Well, they wanted a spring mattress, is it? Mm-hmm. You know, it's ribeye, it's not fillet. Mm-hmm. It's this, it's that. Like the <laughs> the nature of, of treatment and just doing healing work is you have to know that you're gonna be fighting the disease, that you're gonna be fighting that part of them that doesn't want to get better, that's been in control a long time. 
and you're going to get the teeth. I always say it's self-hate projected outwards. And the staff has to know and believe that it has nothing to do with them. Why Absolutely not. Absolutely Can't take it not. personal. And I've seen a lot of places kick people out for showing up exactly, if for showing up for reasons of why they're supposed to be there to start with. I've seen a lot of places that want the easy cases. People have a sight that they can see, like, the best in somebody. A mom can see the best in their kid because they've seen the best. They've seen that true nature when they're babies, when they're full of life, energy, and boundless expansion of what they could be, and they're not trapped in the traumas that you know happen later that enslave us. They know that true nature, and... How do I return somebody to factory settings? You don't want to lose them. Yeah. And there's a fine line. You have to build a rapport with somebody first. I can't just bark my orders at somebody when they come to me and expect them to snap into place. That shit doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It does not. You have to be able, like the job is, how do I make you believe in me that I can help you and that I'm not just in it for the money. I'm not just in it for the quickness. I'm in it for the right reasons that my job is to actually do this with you, and I'm going to do it with you. I'm not going to do it for you, and I'm not going to do it to you. I'm going to walk with you through the fire because it's going to be ugly, but you're not going to run me off because they fight. Mm -hmm. They're mean to you. Mm -hmm. But it's because they're so broken and so damaged and so hurt. And so my job is to be able to overcome that, to realize that it's not about me. It's being hurled at me, but it's not – It's it's – their self-hate, their doubt, and they want so badly, that darkness in them wants so badly to scare me off because if I give up on them, then they can give up on themselves. You know, its job is to stamp out the energy before it raises because that darkness knows if this guy catches fire for recovery, I won't be able to keep him down. Paint a picture. What does your environment look like there? What is your facility? What is your place? Where's your, where's your place of healing that you've created? Well, it's in St. Augustine, Florida, which is considered the oldest city in the United States. It's a really unique kind of smaller town. Um, it has a, a, a definitely a unique vibe to it as far as how it feels. And the place, it, it was this really cool, like up on top of a hill overlooking the intercoastal. Water runs right underneath it. And um, there's birds, there's owls, there's hawks, there's osprey. There's all kinds of life, deer, raccoons, that run fox, cats, dogs, you know, that run through there. It's a, it's a special place, and I, most people feel it as soon as they get there. I felt it the first time I, I went there, and um, I knew that was the spot. I didn't have any money when I first saw it, but I, I went to work getting it after that. And it took years from when I first saw it to when we were able to first rent it. Mm-hmm. and a lot of God in that because we didn't have hardly any money. Even when we took it over, we didn't have any money. It's like home. We're not like a hospital. I don't believe that anybody really feels authentic or themselves in a place where they're being prodded. Yeah. It just so happened that it worked out. And that's and the energy, like a treatment center, like a healing center in itself, you can have an idea what you want it to be. Just like, you know, you can have a child and you want them to be a baseball player, but they like ballet. Right. Augustine has become its own entity, not just what I imprinted on it and wanted for it. It's its, its own life. It's its own organism. So it's become a, an amalgamation of everyone who's worked there, everyone who's given life energy to it. And like we were saying earlier, people that work in a place, they trade their life for work. They trade their life for that energy of money, whatever you pay them. So I have to really value that. They're giving their life to help these men. And it's through that vehicle of our place, time or whatever whatever it comes to, I realize these people are given the only finite substance that they have, which is life, in order to give other people life. Because you're going to grow and you're going to have a spiritual awakening there. Our job is to create a, a, a container for you to have that awakening within yourself. Mm-hmm. My job is to help them self-actualize, and that doesn't may not make a lot of sense, but most people can't do it without a guide. There has to be a, 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 a shock to the system and a, and a place where they can do that work, where they're challenged, 
but they're not overwhelmed by the external circumstances of their life where they can actually get present. Like we don't, they don't get phones in there 90 days without a cell phone. That's a, a lot of places would never do that because they know it affects the bottom line, and it probably does. I don't know any other bottom line other than my own. <laughs> if somebody's going to meet that power that's going to guide their life, we have to remove some of the things that block us. And that's through self-reflection. That's through work. They're going to do work there. It's not an easy place. Nothing in life is easy that's worth it. It's Success not. lies behind the struggle. Yeah, definitely. And, it, you know, the struggle is within. It, it's just how you view it. You know, I've had a lot of times in my life where it felt like a struggle, and I have times in my life where it felt meaningful, mm-hmm. and I wasn't seeing the negative in it. But there is nothing. I mean, I, you know, I talk to guys all the time. I say, how many of you wrecked your first car? How many of you, your dad got you another one or your mom got you another one right after? How many of you wrecked that one? How many? And it's like the, they didn't do anything to earn it. They didn't go out there and work for two summers and save money to save for that car and buy it because the things that we give energy to are the things we take care of. Like I'm just not going to give away something that was hard work for me. If I lose it, it hurts. Mm-hmm. So I want to make it hard in a way that it's worth it and there's value in the struggle and that they, if they accomplish it, there's a true feeling of like, I came and did something here. I'm not the same person I was when I got here. Mm-hmm. And that's evident to everybody, not just them. Most of the time, other people see it first. Their families will come on a, on a family intensive weekend and say like, my son's, he's different. Or sometimes he reminds me of the old him. You got still got some more work to do. And right. Yeah, you're right. Right. You know, they no doubt. Right. We, we're we're this is a roller coaster, and right now we're down here. Yeah, we there is there's always more work to do. Yeah, there's no finished products. Thank you for taking the time with us today. And if you like what you heard and you believe it in your heart that it's true, then come see what we do because you're gonna like and believe that's true as well. Augustine Recovery. It's been my life's work. Everything that I've been through, it's been poured into this place, and everything that everyone's been through that works at this place has been poured in for people who really need it, who come here empty, want to be filled, want a new life. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Again, as always, be good to yourself, and we're going to see you next time.